new graphite stock. Not too bad at all. Um, to anyone who's not seen this or familiar with this material, this is a large, mega thick tile of paper, a tile of the graphite. So that's the slab. And you can imagine it does cost a lot for a piece this size because it's grown one atomic layer at a time. And when you look at how thick that is, 12 and a half millimetres, that's a lot of atomic layers. That grows itself um, with a vacuum decomposition, high temperature process where they put a gas in. Only a fluorohydrocarbon based gas and they, they break it down under heat temperature. The carbon atoms fall down onto a flat platelet and because they're so hot, um, a unique thing goes on with the assemblance or the assembly and the structures that form and they tend to form the perfect layer uh, one at a time on top of each other if the conditions are maintained. The rougher the, the making of it is, the worse or the, the texture surface will have more impurities in it and more lumps but a lot of those don't carry all the way through. So you normally get a really good high refined block out of the bottom or section and then you get slightly less refined on the top. When you look at the bottom, that really is a good indicator of the quality. Some of those dimples will carry, you can watch one there, so there's a dimple there. Flip it over and there'll be a, normally an opposing one on the top, but they're not quite matching up, which is a good sign. So, yeah, so that's a massive pyrolytic graphite platelet. Let's see, so we've got 100 even, all the way along, by 230. Wonderful. That's perfect. So there you have it. Now I'll show you what can be done with this next. Okay, this is the short version of me making the 80 by 80 by half an inch, thereabouts, pyrolytic graphite block for my friend the Falcon. Um, I only showed some of the steps because there's quite a few. Um, you don't have to do this by hand, you can use machinery, which I generally do. Um, basically, this material can be machined, um, cut, ground, milled, drilled. Um, when I get it, generally it comes in a large slab, as you saw, I cut it into smaller sections depending on customer requirement and this requirement is to have it nice perfectly square and flat so first thing I basically did is um, found the best edge and gave that a little bit of a rub on the paper and then I switched to that edge which was the opposite edge. The idea here is to basically um, get rid of the saw marks, remeasure, see what you got to work with because generally it'll be a little bit tapered as you can see there, it's a little tapered already. So um, yeah, you'll remeasure it, and then you'll put more pressure on one side and drag it in certain directions. Um, I will do a video on Patreon showing this procedure in full detail, but I'll probably show it with a smaller block, a 25 um, by 25 tile. Um, this is more of just to give you an idea of some of the, the things you can do and how to work this material. So this is the lapping part. Um, oh, by the way, the earlier part, yeah, you'll get really dirty hands. Um, the earlier part I used, a, I think it was a 360, um, a 180 um, grit is probably fine to start with. I didn't have any until the next day when I did this bit of filming. So, I'm just removing the bulk of material at the moment to um, get an idea of the surface. And as you can see, after all that, that's all that's flat. So I had a little bit of a curve on the top, which happens a lot of the time with this material because of the way they manufacture it. So a lot more rubbing went on and basically you make it flat, switch up to a different grade, a finer grade, and then you hit it again and again. It's um doesn't take that long when you're doing the smaller blocks, the ones you see on the right of the picture there. When you're doing a larger block like this, and you know, I was also taking time to um, apply pressure to different sides, and there was other grinding procedure that went on to make it really flat. So um, I do a quick size check. The thing's almost finished now. I still dressed it up with a finer grade after this, um, sides and top and bottom. 
but um, yeah, this is by hand. It's um, sized within sort of 05 of what I wanted, millimeters that is, and it's parallel and square. And also the thickness is a little bit uneven. I mean, it started out almost 14 on one corner and 13.2 on another corner. So I've actually removed quite a lot of top material to get this close. So there'll be a little bit more lapping and grinding that goes on, but before I do that, I decided it's time to put the 45s on. Now this is the old way I used to do it sometimes. Um, basically, you get a template which has two straights at 90 degrees and a 45 in the middle. You use it to rest the part up as you saw, and you just build by hand and eye. Um, very effective. So you don't necessarily need machinery to work this material, and that's sort of the point to this video. Okay, this is the part where I switch up to the 2000 grit for the finishing work. You can go to 3000 grit and you can put like a glass black mirror finish polish on this material if you choose to. But for the purposes of this part, um, I just wanted to sort of get a light polish on it so the surface stays resilient um, and doesn't tend to change too much. So uh, I sort of really just 2000 was the limit with this one. And um, as you can see, even though you can still see bumps and stuff in the material, it's actually perfectly flat to touch. You can't feel those bumps, even though you can see them. That's one of the really amazing things about this material. Uh, also, that's from an angle, as you can see, it's perfectly flat and it reflects light. Now, the finer grip you go and the polishing you do eventually, you can look at it straight on and see your face in it. So, final size check on the thickness, and lo and behold, that's uh, within... 10 microns, I believe, by hand, lapping. The material does help, there's a secret to that. But anyway, that's enough for now. And now I'll show you what can be done with it. Okay, now that I've finished uh, refining this tile of pyrolithic graphite for my friend, uh, it came out pretty much exactly how I would have liked it. I've just uh, got my granite table out, which has got three levelling points. I'm going to do that in a second. I've got a, a backboard, which is plaster or drywall, uh, depends what country you're in, and um, yeah, I'm just going to do one quick experiment and set up with it before I send it off to him, which has to be sent on Saturday, today's Thursday, I've been working a lot over the night to get this one ready in time, just so I could film it before I had to send it, that's all, and um, yeah, um, I've got other stuff going on in here, this has been sitting there for 10 years and just recently uncovered, find out some more, anyway, let's get on with this. Okay, this is the setup I'll be doing tonight, which is basically a ring magnet, another ring magnet. You can use small ones, you can use large ones, you can stack them, and you have them so that they're basically pulling together. So be a little bit careful on how you construct it and put it together. And basically you just get your prolific graphite block in the middle. So they're your major components. So you've got the large magnets for lifting, prolific graphite block in the middle. You don't have to use one this large, of course. This is a 10 by 10 neodymium cube magnet. You basically um, put them up against the side. And that's basically it. It is that easy to do these experiments. When you're working with solid state magnetics and diamagnetic materials, you find that, um, yeah, there's a lot of little quirky setups and behaviours that you can observe and that you can do. And you don't need to go out and buy a massive tile of pyrolithic graphite either. Just a normal uh, 25 by 25 square, six millimeters thick. Um, you can conduct these experiments. And if you look back in my playlist, I actually did this experiment previously with two tiles instead of one for most of the video. And um, yeah, it was a very easy setup and the levitation is quite simple. And you tend to not smash up magnets when you have little accidents if you're using two tiles instead of one. But I think with one tile sometimes, if you get the spacing right, because if you tune the distance and spacing of the magnets and the prolific graphite, you'll find a sweet spot where the levitation gaps will be much larger and the holding force in that will also be a little bit improved. When I did most of these experiments, I didn't have the time luxury to play around as much as I would have liked um, to have achieved some of these um, slightly better results. That being said, um, I'm in the middle of a renovation, so most of my magnet stuff's actually half packed away at the moment and it's making uh, this sort of work a little bit tricky but I'm uh, still getting it done. 
Now, an announcement that uh, anyone who's watched my magnetic levitation videos mainly, um, and that's sort of what they're into, what they like, I will be starting um, how-to videos. I'll show um, a form of diamagnetic levitation, uh, and then I'll do an explanation, and I'll show a how-to do it yourself. Um, these videos will be on YouTube, and the uh, more detailed version in depth will be on Patreon. So, if you're uh, at all keen on diamagnetic levitation or magnetic experimentation, you may be interested to uh, just keep an eye out, um, subscribe, put the uh, little notification bell on so that you get notified when the videos come out. Uh, probably be one a month for Patreon and one a month for YouTube with the magnetic levitation videos. So, that's the video. I hope you like what you saw. Hope to see you next time. Um, please share, subscribe, spread, um, especially the share and um, spread. A little bit light on those at the moment, so please chuck us a couple if you can. And um, yeah, stick around after I finish talking and watch uh, some of the little accidents that happened while I was filming this. This is Adam out. Boing. Hmm, problem. Just don't want to do.